it's an honor to be speaking today and especially to hear about all of our work and how and the interesting intersections. I think when each person was talking, we probably all had more questions for that person. Um, but when I talk about what I do, uh, when kids ask me what research I do, it sounds really uncool. Um, and my 11-year-old nephew figured that since I was living in New York, I must be um, a YouTube star. <laughs> and he's really disappointed that I'm not this guy, which you can't really see very well, but he's water skiing under a bridge um, in uh, New York. Uh, or I don't know where he's water skiing, but anyways, he's under a bridge and he has 8 million subscribers and is just super cool. I'm wondering, can we dim the lights a little so the screen shows up a little bit better? Or um, just because I have little words, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I was just showing other pictures of the kinds of stuff that my 11 year old nephews are looking at on, um, on YouTube uh, and how many views these things are getting, like 3 million, <coughs> 3.4 million. When we think about our work and how many views we, we probably <laughs> get, it's very discouraging. Um, and, and then my <coughs> nephews also have their own YouTube channels where they film planes landing and post them to YouTube. Um, and so when I got an invitation to do work uh, for a YouTube channel, I immediately said yes. Um, it's, a it's a program called Crash Course, and when I said um, that it was Crash Course to some other teens, they were like, oh, that's cool, what do you crash into? And I was like, oh, well, it's, a, it's like a, a series on like, things to learn, like crash meaning studying, and, and then they were like, mm, no, not interesting, so I'm still not cool. But um, while I've been doing this work, um, I've been studying, uh, I've been writing up media literacy for high school students, right? And so I've had to go back to the basics, and this is kind of fun when you're, when you're, when you're into your research, sometimes we forget to see the forest through the trees, and so having to step back and think of what, what are the basic things people need to know in order to practice media literacy right now um, has been a really interesting exercise because I realized that what we traditionally were teaching and doing, I think, very well, has really encountered a lot of challenges, not just in the past year, but, but in the past couple years with social media um, and most recently with the news. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. That um, my presentation's called um, how, media, how Media Literacy Responds to the Unexpected. And I'd, I'd like to say that for centuries, for decades if not centuries, we've been responding to the unexpected, right? We didn't expect um, TV. We didn't expect film. Uh, we certainly didn't expect the internet um, and, and now, now social media. And a strength of media literacy um, for those, I, since it sounds like quite a few of you are working with youth um, learning media literacy skills is we would teach to identify bias, right? We might use an advertisement as an example. We would say, what's missing here? What's included? Why is it included? Why are these choices being made? What's the point of view? What's the purpose? We all know this. These are the typical skills that we teach. Um, and the reason for this is to make the underlying structures of media messages visible. But where I think, while we've been successful in applying these to traditional media, and we've been extending that in, to the internet and to social media, I don't think we anticipated that young people would need to apply these media literacy skills to content being created by their friends and family. So we teach, we teach, we teach them how to even self-represent, we teach them how to behave towards others in like cyberbullying training and things like that, but we're, and we teach how to engage with news, we teach how to engage with the different TV shows and um, and the examples that Amanda provided yesterday on Snapchat and Reddit <laughs> forums and different things. But what we haven't really considered is, is how teens and, and well, how young people engage with like the, the everyday representations that are coming their way on all of these different social media platforms. Um, so two things I'd like to talk about first, and then I'm gonna move into the third, a third category, is I'd like to talk about believing the highlights reels that we all share, and, and um, figuring out how to trust the information your friends and family are posting when, when they're not probably reading more than the headlines either. So I have a few quotes. What got me interested in this, um, I, I, was, I was working on this, I'm working on this program for Crash Course, and at the same time, I'm talking to friends <coughs> who counsel suicidal, um, university students and suicidal teens. And one thing they keep saying is that they're overwhelmed by their social media and they keep saying things like, 
Um, everybody else's life, se it seems like they've got it together. It seems like they're having more fun than me. It seems like you know, they're better looking than me. They, they're more liked than me. You know, all of these different um, anxiety producing uh, scenarios. And, uh, and then recently, New York Times Magazine came out with an article that, that really went into depth about this, um, about teens feeling more anxiety. And so I've, I've grabbed a few quotes from different places. Um, but, but basically that I'm, I'm constantly judging my self-worth online. Um, I would think, oh, people don't want to see me in their timeline. Um, a, a, a girl interviewed um, for in, in Australia said, um, if I'm not invited to a party um, and I see the pictures, I think like, why am I not invited? And, and she went on to say, you know, and then she feels uncomfortable around the people when she sees them again and she's jealous. And these are all things that were happening anyway, but now, now there's this, this other layer of visibility that you might not have had before, and it's, it's constant. As Amanda said yesterday, there, there's this feeling that you can't escape the news, and I think that that's, that's pretty much all, all, you can't escape the network, right, as she said. Um, so some statistics uh, from the Australian Stress and Wellbeing Survey, 55% of teens said they fear others are having a more rewarding experience than I am. They also said that it was the same percentage that they feared that their friends were, too. So there was a category for others and a category for friends. And then um, while a Pew study found that 78% of teens do not feel worse about their lives based on what they post, 21% say they do. That's not an insignificant number. Um, and so, so this is an area that I haven't seen a lot of work in my field in. I, I, um, as psychologists, you might have more background. Um, but what I'm concerned about is that, that, that there might be a space here for media literacy to help that we haven't been considering. And, and so one thing is applying some of the teaching that we do for advertising and for other media to, to this, that, that you are just seeing the highlights reel. Think about how much you self-curate, um, how you represent yourself, and, and then apply that to what you're, what you're seeing. And, um, and then, and so this is an area I'd like to hear more from you guys about like possible strategies that, that, that we can maybe draw from from psychology that could um, complement media literacy training and, and find a balance um, to help kids who are feeling highly anxious. Another area I'd like to um, talk about is, is trust. Let's see. So yeah, uh, trust when everyone is sharing and no one is reading. Um, and basically, how often do we retweet something because the person we trusted tweeted it and the headline looks good, might have skimmed a little bit, might not have. I think that we're doing this less now, but, but this is something that um, quite a few people do. I know I've done it. Um, and I'm not sure we're considering who's trusting us. And uh, we were talking about this last night at dinner, and I was using an example that I have, I have two friends who are grandmothers and are retired teachers. And, um, they, they've been somewhat consistently posting news that turns out to be um, incorrect. And um, so somebody else will post like a Snopes link or something like that. And so I asked them, you know, how do you, how do you feel about that? Like, how do you feel that you put that out there and, and it's, you know, it, it ended up not being um, correct or accurate. And they said, well, you know, it's up to people to go check it out. They can decide if it's, if it's true or false. And I said, yeah, but you're posting it. And so there's people who trust you. And, 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 um, and we got into a discussion about trust and distrust and, and like what responsibility we have because their, their grandkids are teens and they're, they're, they're reading this information and are they sharing it, are they believing it? And, um, and Amanda's study got me thinking that those, those students said, or those youth said that they, they're, being, they're being critical, right? That they're, they're checking from different sources, they're um, looking for cooperation. We also know from um, a recent study from Stanford by uh, Sarah McGrew and Sam Weinberg that um, people, and well actually uh, David's work as well, that people overestimate their skills, right? And so um, in, in this case, in the um, Stanford study, they, um, they, they tested what their knowledge, how, how well they would evaluate websites and, and consistently they were choosing the false information and choosing advertising, um, commercial versus non-commercial. Um, the Office of Communication in the UK uh, 
runs annual um, surveys for adult media literacy and youth media literacy, and they, they had consistent findings consistent with the Stanford study that adults and teens overestimate their media literacy skills. And then when presented with something like Google search results and, and asked to identify which were um, commercial and which were not, people couldn't tell the difference. So there's a concern that even though people think that they're able to evaluate, they may not be. So is there, is there space there to be teaching people to be more critical of, of information coming from friends and family or to be more critical of their sources? And then also is there space to be teaching people to not share without reading the headlines kind of thing? And that's something that um, the executive director of the National Association for Media um, Literacy Education, uh, Michelle Chula Lipkin, actually recommends. She said a very simple fix for, for all of us to practice is just to read something before you post it. Now, is reading enough? Well, reading is a good step, um, and, and, and right, is, is reading enough? Um, I know that I've been caught in this. Um, I run a newsletter um, with a colleague, uh, Leah Plunkett, at, at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. It's the Student Data Privacy um, Equity and Digital Literacy newsletter, if you're interested. And we have had a lot of conversations about this challenge of vetting news. It seems like it's gotten more and more difficult um, when you're trying to corroborate. There always seems to be a source that will corroborate, but whether that source is reliable, and then getting in discussions of what's reliable and what's not. And we're always relying on kind of our trusted sources, um, and sometimes those can be incorrect too. So this isn't a simple problem. This is a very complex, layered problem. And um, so can media literacy help? I think that. Um, just as Sarita was saying that the answers to how much time to share, how much to share something is sometimes, I think here too, it's sometimes. I think that that's kind of where, where we're going. Um, and I have a third provocation, and we're, we're also going to be doing a little group work, so uh, just to prepare you. Um, I wanted to ask you, how many likes have you gotten today, if you've been online? And how, how many people have tweeted or retweeted something that you about you or liked or something like that? How many times have you checked today? How many times did you check yesterday? This group isn't looking like you check a lot. You're like, you know, I'm feeling kind of zen about the whole thing. Likes? Who needs likes? But um, other groups, you know, it would be like, I can tell you right now how many I have. And um, and and we are not alone. For those of you who do it, um, as as. Most of you probably know it, that um, we, okay, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, we, we're using technologies that have been designed to exploit our psychology. They've been designed to exploit that we want to be liked, we want to be loved, and we love seeing, our, we love seeing pictures of our friends, we love our, pic, our friends acknowledging us. Um, and so I'd like to just share two quotes. Probably some of you saw the news yesterday with Sean Parker, um, the first president of Facebook. Um, this print might be small, so I'll just read to you from um, the Washington Post article that I grabbed. Um, With each like and comment, Facebook is, quote, exploiting human psychology on purpose to keep users hooked on a social validation feedback loop. Um, with hel helping Facebook get off the ground in 2004, Parker said he and others involved in the social network thought, how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means that we sort of need to give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content and that's going to get you more likes and comments. Um, Tristan Harris, who's been talking about this for a while, um, first introduced me uh, to the, uh, to the um, Stanford Persuasive Technologies Lab run by uh, BJ Fogg, which uh, Tristan Harris said quite a few of the technologists who ended up in Silicon Valley um, went through. And, and this is where like, you learn how to keep people on your app, how to keep people coming back. So you learn the, the process of rewards and, um, and, and, and uh, what, what Dana Boyd and others have called attention hacking, how to keep you engaged and constantly thinking about it and wanting more. Um, so, so I picked this quote because when we're thinking about media literacy, we normally think of it as an individual responsibility. We might think about it in terms of policy and education, but, uh, but most of the time the responsibility rests on the individual, that it's up to us to discern what's credible, it's up to us to, to discern what to trust. Um, but in an era of fake news, which I think others of you are going to be talking about, in an era of, um, like, of 
where, where information is intentionally being um, distorted and false. We have that issue happening. We also have this issue of algorithmic attention hacking. And so in an era where the information we're being fed, we, we have no sense of the corpus. So before we knew, like, here are the newspapers available, and I'm choosing to read these. We might not know everything going on, but it was something that we could envision. And I remember when, when we were first talking about, um, my, my graduate work was in cognitive psychology, and when we were first talking about like Google search, we were, we were saying, but people can't see the corpus. People don't, know, people don't know what's being excluded. We don't know what Google's excluding. We don't know what it's not searching. And this was a major concern of ours. And then it just seemed like there's so many more other overwhelming concerns that we've forgotten this concern, that, that we still don't know what's, be, what's available and what we're missing, what's be, that, that basic media literacy of what's being excluded and what's being included. One. Two, we don't know why now we're being fed the information we're being fed. Um, that the process of deciding what to serve us isn't transparent. A third concern is that as researchers, I can't study what Amanda read this morning versus um, what what um, Sarita read this morning. I can't compare that to what Esther read. I don't know. We could have all gone to, this, to Facebook this morning. We could have all gone to Google News this morning. We could have all searched the same term. And we're all getting different results. And we have no way of knowing what, what each other's being served. So then it becomes, we, ha we, we can't even know um, our, personal, like our personal news experience. We don't have a shared experience that we can be evaluating or that we're archiving. Um, so, so, so then, how, how does media literacy fit into this very unexpected environment? Where, and, and we say, well, we can, teach, we can teach that it exists, right? We can teach that, that, that this, these choices are being made. But I don't think we can teach how to game this. I, I try to game it. I have different browsers. And I, I, I mean, I don't even know. How would we know if we were gaming it or not? Right? I mean, we don't know. I mean, I guess if I start getting served ads, you know, that I'm, you know, younger and a different gender or in a different country or something, then maybe. But how? I mean, really, I don't know. I don't know what's different. I, I, I can't. I'm making assumptions because what I'm reading is my normal, and I'm assuming that we're sharing a normal that we're not really sharing. Um, so, okay. So yeah. So those were the unexpected things that. Uh, we at Data and Society have been encountering in our research, but I think that we're all encountering unexpected possibilities and situations that that are being called that media literacy is being called upon to respond to, that that are really challenging to figure out how media literacy can respond. And so, one challenge that I've been um, working through this year is is figuring out what those barriers are, like wh where the areas are that media literacy actually can make a difference and help, where it can't, and what I don't know. Because there's a lot we don't know about media literacy, too. The, the, the research is very limited, um, uh, connect, showing a connection between education and outcomes for media literacy. We need a lot more rigorous research, of course. But um, what I thought would be a fun exercise for us, since we're going to be in this room together all day, is um, a chance to talk a little bit more about this among ourselves. And so um, I don't know if you're familiar with pair sharing, but um, OK. <laughs> Since there's so many uh, teachers and, and, and um, people in the room who you know, are familiar with education, I figured that it would be a good guess. But basically, if you could um, turn to somebody, and if, there's, you know, if, it, if it needs to be a group of three, that's fine, and just talk about um, what unexpected challenges for media literacy have come up in your work. And then um, what we'll do is talk about that as a group. And so um, is it really 947 or is it really 1047? Um, 947. OK, so um, let's just talk until the, the top of the hour, 10 or 11 if you're looking at this clock. Um, so uh, let's just talk for, for 10 minutes and just share a little bit about your work and um, what unexpected challenges you've encountered. There were so many interesting discussions that I actually feel badly stopping them. Um, and so I'd really love for you to share uh, some, some, some things that came up. We have a, about five minutes to share. I wrote down some of the, these are just the phrases I overheard as I was walking by. And as you can tell, they're incredibly compelling. We have um, rules. 
When do they change? How do we know they've changed? Who do they change for? Um, we've got distinguishing friend friendly banter and jokes from something more serious. Um, we lose benefits if we start to restrict things. Um, and we sometimes don't know when the functionalities changed, was what that conversation was about. Um, we had, uh, what is data? Um, we, 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 there's so much different data coming out, how do we interpret it? What data is being collected about me? Um, we had somebody talking about self-curation so that um, for jobs and, and um, people we respect seeing things we might not want them to see. Um, estimation of our own skills and uh, why we might do a poor job of that. Civility and the art of disagreement. Um, cult of personality, contexts in which um, this stuff's happening. And I heard somebody say, what are we opting into? I thought that was a good place to... Um, so what, what came up for you as things that were unexpected that you've been having to address in your research? Um, open questions, solutions, five minutes to change the world, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think a big thing for us were, as we're looking to update our curriculum, which really covers information literacy, data privacy, cyberbullying, just like the gamut, is how do you, I mean, we have plenty of resources to teach kids how to fact check how to you know understand what's credible and not but I don't think we've done a good job yet of making them understand the why it's even important so I, I feel like a lot of what we're discussing right now we know is important I maybe we could articulate it clearly sometimes I think I fail to be able to articulate it clearly even though I know why it's important inside but how do we make you really understand the importance of like what what is the repercussion of the sharing false information, you know, like versus just don't share it, it's not good, but like why, what is the impact of that? Um, for a lot of high school students who've been using technology since they were born, it's like if you told them like you're getting all, all your data is being collected, this, that, and the other, they would just say, okay, like, <laughs> I don't know, like why, why, why would that matter to me? Like you're saying that, but I don't even know what that means. So like right. I, I think it's really trying to expose them to why these things are important. That actually aligns with Neil and Susan. You were talking a little bit, a bit about this, weren't you? That um, the who, the the decide, who decides what's important, and mm. or if that was just like <laughs> yeah. one of the smaller s slivers of conversation. No, okay, I think what we were talking about in that part of our wide ranging conversation was, you know, who decides what's trusted, and when you have a bunch of this is what I talked about, what we talked about a little bit last night is. You know, not only is it helping them decide why it's important, but also who gets to decide what's important and who gets to decide what ends up being interested. And when you have a lot of people who are suddenly, or not so suddenly, questioning um, who gets to decide what's important, that can be a real challenge for viewers. And I think that the attention there is, do we want Facebook to decide what's important? Um, do we trust the people at Facebook to decide that do we, would we prefer that? Um, would we, you know, do, do, since since we believe that maybe Google and Facebook share like a techno libertarian viewpoint, do we want them sharing that? But then what happens when I don't know if you've been following the news, but um, uh, one of the major uh, Chinese tech companies, Tencent, uh, bought a 12% share of Snapchat, and and um, uh, I was I was reading in Bloomberg this morning about you know how Alibaba and um, the, the the, the larger Chinese tech companies aren't investing in U.S. tech companies. So maybe we trust um, the founders of Google or we trust the founders of Facebook, but then do we trust a foreign investor or do we not trust any of them at all? And, and um, with those algorithms that are hacking our attention. <laughs> yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, anyone else want to share? Yes. I can share one and then also something that's related. So we do a lot of concept mapping and line mapping and so it's a great time to really think about some of these questions and the ways in which you can design your youth development programs to get at these things. So we know that peers trust other peers and sometimes the information that we need to put out, if we ask young people to put out that information as ambassadors so that we can really grow and put forth um, some things. One of the challenges that we face is that we work with some homeschool families and um, a lot of times those families have a single email address and they don't have access to social media. And so then how do we bring those young people into the fold? Um, because there's a, a large experience that they're not having. Um, and so 
then how do you communicate with those families, communicate with those young people, and bring everybody into the fold at the same time? We, we went all over the place, and I'll just take one piece and then I'm going to add more, but I think one of the things that's personally sort of frustrating to me in some ways is the conversation around literacy is really important. Clearly, we need all that. We need education and we need mechanisms for delivering it. We need it to be in schools and families, but I, I keep wondering how is it that we address the ways in which um, sort of all the social corrections for our deepest impulses are, are no longer in place, or so that social media and a lot of what communication technology now affords us really preys upon or amplifies or exacerbates sort of the, our worst human inclination. So the, the piece you read about the dopamine and them knowing mm -hmm. that they're actually, you know, that they're exploiting that. And, and that's a tough thing to teach because you know, there's no intellectual corrective for, 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 for that impulse because it's very, very deep. And I, so that's the thing I grapple with. How do we used to just have the structures in place because we had walls and we had time today and we had you know, you could keep the phone out of someone's room. It's just, they were just part of life and the phone was gone now. Um, and I don't know how we address that. And doesn't that relate to your conversation about civility and um, what's, I, I like, this group was asking what's different. That we've always had incivility. We've always had people disagreeing and there's been people who don't want to listen to other opinions. But this, this notion of technology exacerbating and maybe shifting norms? Right, because we were, with regard to the phone conversation, we were talking about how when you first had a phone, the idea of is it okay to listen in on your neighbor, <laughs> their conversation was like, well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, and now we're like, oh, you don't listen in on the, on the other line. So is being an internet troll kind of the equivalent of listening in on the other line, and are we going to develop new social norms? to overcome that, or is this like a totally, completely new level of that issue? There is um, to that the, one of the points where so much data and how to interpret, it was, that's what I got out of our conversation, was just the inundation of <coughs> negative data, and how do young people know how to filter through that? And one of the things that Janice shared was just this uh, newspaper called Positive News, that she had access to and just starting to read that and how it affected her mentally and emotionally, just in taking positive news rather than all the negative news. So the positive news, positive news is out there, but what our young people are inundated with is the negative. And so how do they, how do they navigate that? And this relates back, I think, to this notion of concept mapping. If we can, I, I'm assuming this, is, this, this might be something that's coming out is where they're going and, and um, how that's impacting their view of things probably like anxiety levels, hopefulness, hopelessness, um, willingness to participate in that. That's right. The cynicism that you brought up last night may have been your talk, which I totally see too. Thank you all. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just wanted to add, wanted to add, add, an, add an example to this, uh, to this conversation. At, at Cornell, we had a lot of, uh, we had a, a, had a big racial incident early on in the semester and, and actually things have exacerbated over time. And students are telling me that they've turned off their Snapchat because they want to get out of the conversation, the constant conversation on campus about racial issues. So that's one thing slightly older students are doing. So when, when do they decide to disengage and when do they like what motivates, because we, because we heard other <laughs> cases where students found the, the cell phone use empowering during, during a racial incident. So, so that was at the moment of the incident though. I wonder if over time if that changed. So at what points do they become you know, highly engaged and at what points do they disengage? It was, it was around the time that they thought it was starting to affect their academic performance. They started to tune things out. Thank you all. I know this is just the beginning of an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you. <laughs>